Okay, now we're going to move on to something that has a little bit of something for everyone. Uh, I think everybody loves Rick and Morty. If you don't, um, yeah, I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know how well the science is always grounded, but it's a fun show. And um, we have today, lucky enough to have Matt Brady, the author of a book called The Science of Rick and Morty. Um, for the comic book fans out there, he... Uh, actually started by co-founding Newsarama. That's how he got into the whole geek business back in the late 90s. Now, a high school science teacher. Um, that career path makes perfect sense to me. Um, and uh, someone approached him about doing this book and he dove right into it. And today we're gonna look at something very specific from my personal favorite episode, uh, Pickle Rick. Um, could uh, Rick actually control a cockroach by poking at its brain. Let's find out. Mitch, push the button. Hi, I'm Matt Brady. I'm a high school science teacher, the co-founder of the scienceof.org, a science writer, communicator, I guess I say. And the reason why I'm here today, I am the author of, bear with me one second. It's been a minute since I've taught a class on uh, Zoom. There we are the author of The Science of Rick and Morty, the unofficial guide to Earth's stupidest show. The thing I love about how Rick and Morty uses science is that the fantastic ideas are just presented as almost offhand references, as givens. Um, some of these things are pretty challenging. For example, it's a given that in Rick and Morty, there are multiple universes. There are multiple versions of Rick, Morty, and the whole Smith family out there. And if a new Rick shows up or a weird Rick shows up, oh, it's just a different Rick from another universe. So, of course, of course, it's just a given. Oh, as a side note, I always have to bring this up. As a side note, I am just amazed as an old-time fan of multiple universes from DC Comics and Star Trek's Mirror Mirror episode, and now to the point that we have it as part an ingrained part of the the marvel cinematic universe and it's out there you can stop anybody on the street and say what's a multiple universe and they will tell you oh it's just other place it's like here but it's different there's another version of me and there's another version of you it's just nuts to me in a good way that people know what multiple universes are that's the power of pop culture and uh kind of pushing these ideas out there so anyway, before we get started on the the science of Rick and Morty that I want to talk about today, I think there's there's a quick a quick aside here I want to talk about because I think with skepticism there can be a seductive rabbit hole that you can go down, especially it comes out when we're talking about pop culture, um, and that's used to use skepticism to the point that just just say oh the things in these stories it's not real it can't happen it doesn't happen that way, and. I mean, I think we all have our go-to references of people who do that and kind of how we think about them. Um, I think when you take your first steps as a serious skeptic, I, I, it's almost like the ground is slanted that way and it's an easy slide right into that rabbit hole and there are not many handholds to get yourself out of there. Um, it's always easy to label something as dumb. Uh, it's easy to label as to say something can't exist because, oh, it's uh, science or, or whatever you want to say about it. Um, but the thing, when it comes to pop culture, you can't do that. You're talking about something that people have invested time and emotion into. There's a sense of, of ownership with it, really. There's a feeling that I own part of that. So, well, let me put it this way. Folks don't get dressed up in Vulcan ears and Starfleet uniforms and go out to Vegas this, aus, this August for the 55-year mission convention because they think or want to be told that Star Trek is dumb. Unironically insult the science of Star Trek and you're personally insulting your audience. There's no win in shaming people ever ever, especially if your end goal is to help them to understand something new. So as an educator, as a high school teacher, I teach physics and chemistry. I use a lot of pop culture, a lot of pop culture in my classroom. And it's a common ground, a safe space where we can all kind of geek out and, and just think this stuff is cool. And no one's feelings about this or that property or character we, we don't insult those now they're they're all cool but 
you want to talk about the science in it? Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that real science. And you're going to love it because it's tied to this thing that you already know. So, all right, I know I promised you Rick and Morty. So back to Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty's use of science in the series is the best way that something like that can be put in. It's not, it doesn't feel like it's just something that somebody in the writer's room grabbed last week and is going to jam into a story just as a reveal or to save us from the problem of the week or a deus ex machina. I like that Rick and Morty just gives me the cool science, lets me kind of hold it. If I want to dig in, I can dig in. And sometimes I do. Personally, there are dozens, hell, there are hundreds of topics I've read about or dug into because something sparked my interest in a cool way from science fiction. And in this case, Rick and Morty. And that's where we are today. So let me show you my road. And this is literally how it happened. Watched the episode, got interested, started digging around, wrote an article. Later, later the book came. Um, but it, it, the, the episode that took me down a road that was lined with cockroach brains. So starting off, one of my favorite episodes, I think a lot of people's favorite episode is Pickle Rick. Now, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to spoil it. But you may have seen it. You may not have. Let me, let me kind of help you out here. So go along with me. So Rick, um, at the beginning of the episode, turns himself into a pickle in order to skip out on a family therapy session set up by his daughter, Beth. It's a, it's a shit move as well as a serious flex of Rick's abilities, um, but turning yourself into a pickle. Okay, I know what I just said about, you know, denial and skepticism. Okay, that one can't happen, but that's, that, we'll give him that one. That's, that's a, that can't happen. You can't turn yourself into a pickle. But anyway, going along with the story, a few more things happen and Rick ends up in the sewer or the, the wastewater system. I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, it's underground and not a nice place. Cockroaches and rats are everywhere. Rick, ever resourceful, realizes that he's most likely going to be eaten by something down there, and also he can't move unless he takes charge of a situation, and the cockroaches are the key to getting things moving. Sure, sure, there's a bunch of other stuff that happens in this episode, like, like this, and, and this, and, and this, but none of that happens if Rick doesn't make some magic with that cockroach first. And that's something that I, I love about this all. The stuff here, okay, it's it's not real, but it's like next door to real. And, and in some ways, probably the real stuff is a little bit cooler than what's in this episode. So back to Rick, yeah? Okay, so Rick has fallen down into the drain pipe. He lures a cockroach closer by biting his own pickle lip and bleeding out some brine. Roaches, and these look to be American cockroaches, good old Paraplanita Americana, aren't necessarily attracted to brine and salty flavors, though. Hey, fun side fact, salt has long been used as a homemade roach repellent, uh, Survival Bunker 101. When you're packing up all your food stores, soak the wrappers or the cloth that you're wrapping your food stuff in, in salt, and that way the roaches will just leave it alone. However, roaches are omnivores. They're curious. And if we're getting back to Rick in this sewer who bit his lip to attract a roach, they'll sniff with their antenna and otherwise probe all around an environment to find food or just go and look at something that's novel in that environment, say like a pickle that's making noise. So anyway, once the roach is close enough to his mouth, Rick grabs it with his mouth yeah and crushes it right at the juncture of its head and thorax killing it or stunning it it's hard to tell for sure he gently removes the part of the roach's exoskeleton that covers the brain and he, he pokes around with his tongue this is a rather disturbing image um until the roach's legs start moving from there he manipulates the roach's legs to maneuver his pickle body on top of the roach and then controls the roach as it moves him along the ground all the time, just kind of tonguing the brain, phrase I never thought I'd say. Later in that episode, he's shown to have made a system of roach legs that he controls via a network of nerves that he manipulates with his tongue right down there. Hang on, let me get back to my school stuff right there. there all those little roach brains and, and nerve fibers there. Cool. Yeah. 
Now, don't go poking your tongue into cockroach brains um, to see if you can move the legs. It's not very hygienic and you'll lose friends no matter how cool you think it is. Um, but you're also much too big. And, but what Rick did might have been accurate when it comes to the, the real life science of cockroach brains. So there's no real reason to repeat it. We'll talk about that in a little bit though. If you're willing to use something other than tongue, yeah, there's, there's a way you can do this stuff. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. So let's get back to some cockroach stuff here. So a cockroach is an insect. Um, its body is made up of three distinct regions, the, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, most roaches have vestigial wings that they either can't fly or they can only fly for very short periods. Roaches have antennas on their heads and two antenna-like sensory organs back here, the cerci, uh, at the end of their abdomens. And among the cockroaches, eyes. Uh, it has about a thousand lenses on each eye. Um, between the eyes, the cerci, and its antenna, it can sense and respond to um, any kind of stimulation really, really quickly. Ever try to sneak up on a cockroach? You can't. It's like they know you're coming because they do. Sensory-wise, as far as a cockroach is concerned, a human trying to sneak up on it would be like Godzilla trying to walk up on a dog or something. People give off smells. We change the local temperature and humidity and move the air in weird ways when we're there compared to when we're not there. Try to catch a roach, you might get lucky now and then, but more often than not, that roach is gonna get away and come back another day. I mean, its whole face is like a big old radar dish. It, it, it knows you're coming. Let's talk about the nervous system of a cockroach. It's pretty simple and that's not a slam. Uh, it's a reference to its classification and its organization. The cockroach nervous system isn't centralized like ours. It's not one big brain and, and in, in the head region. Um, it has a brain that's also called the supraesophageal ganglion right there. And the ganglia that stretch down the body. If you look at the, the roach from the side, you'd see this supraesophageal ganglion above the esophagus, which is the, the throat tube that goes down to the stomach and the digestive system. Also in the head, but below the esoph uh, esophagus is the subesophageal ganglion, which connects to the double spinal cord. Look at that, double spinal cord going down right there and a whole series of ganglia. So obviously ganglia here, that's the key word. Simply, they're just clusters of nerve cells in one place that appear kind of as swellings along the nerve fiber. They're not brains. You can't say that a cockroach has 12 brains or something like that, which that's just frightening. Um, they, they don't have complex organization like a brain would. However, they're the centers of, of nerve control and signaling. It's, it's this distribution of the cockroach's nervous system that allows a headless roach to live for a week after it's decapitated. And even then it dies of thirst because, not because it's, it, you, you took off its mouth. You, you took off its mouth and it can't, it can't drink. But anyway, back up to the brain slash supraesophageal ganglia. The roach brain, and I'm using air quotes on roach brain there, it's uh, largely concerned with the incoming sensory stimuli, why the subesophageal ganglia focuses on motion, controlling the legs, the wings, and the mouth. I don't want to derail this good time here by talking about neuroscience 101 and how nerves fire, but the super quick version, and this is pretty much common in most forms of life uh, across around the planet, um, is that there's electricity involved in the form of positively charged sodium and potassium ions. Again, I'm not gonna get into the full nitty gritty here, but when a nerve cell receives a stimulus, it will fire and send a message down to the next nerve cell and the next, and ultimately to the, in this case, the ganglia uh, and the muscles or whatever tissues need to respond to that stimuli. So again, super short version, Pickle Rick poked a part of the roach's brain with his tongue, his salty, salty tongue loaded with sodium and potassium ions. And that presumably changed the electrochemical composition of wherever those ions landed in the roach's brains. So it's not a stretch to say that he activated those, those nerve cells. 
precise anatomical location aside where Rick's tongue was hitting, there actually is a spot in the roach's brain that can get those legs to move. That's called the central complex. So we're up here, oops, sorry, point to the right thing. We're up here in the uh, brain area. This, this is the supraesophageal ganglia. And this is the central complex right there. It's an unpaired part. I'll show it to you right here. So this is the central complex. This is the brain. A cockroach's brain is paired pieces. So you got these pieces here mirrored over here, but this central complex, it's unpaired in there. That's the thing that you can think of it as the hardwired instructions for what response different stimuli give, give when the roach receives anything, tactile, visual, olfactory, or other senses. The central complex is essential for the, the sensory motor integration. The neurons located there, they encode that sensory information received by the antenna, the cirrhosis, the eyes, and send it out as responses. So researchers have found out that you can put electrodes into the central complex of a cockroach, and you can record the, the signals coming in from the sensory inputs and going out to the motor centers in an experiment that used this method, the entirety of the central complex's actions were recorded, again, in response to stimuli. And when specific regions were stimulated later, the cockroach then responded as if it had made the decision as if it had received the, the stimulus to respond that way, to run or something. It was just poke the region of the brain. Again, not entirely surprising, but it's all mapped. This central complex is all mapped. It's all ready to go right there. Hit this one part, it runs to the right. Hit this other part, it runs to the left, speeds up, slows down. Then it gets weird because you can attach electrodes to a cockroach's central complex, record, and these are tiny electrodes because tiny, tiny little brains, and you can record the roach's stimuli, what's going on in the roach's central complex as it's going around in a novel environment. You can record it and then take a new roach, wire its brain, Put those put electrodes into its central cortex, central central complex, and then play back that first roach's recording, and that new roach will do the same thing. It will do the same thing again. I think kind of as we all are marinated a little bit in science fiction, we can go, yeah, that's a, yeah, I can see that. This is real. This is real. This is really really real. And that's where it's kind of, huh, at least for me. Anyway, if you want to think of a roach or other insects, since the central complex is, is highly conserved in, uh, in, in insects, um, it, it, it serves a similar function in bug after bug after bug throughout evolution. If you want to think of them as tiny little robots with pre-programmed instructions, uh, that's just waiting for the right neuron to fire, the right sensory input to come in, and then it will kick off this chain of commands. Um, I guess this is your permission to do just that. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I know. Let's get back to Rick. Um, this was about Rick and Morty. So anyway, Rick activated the part of the brain roughly in the center, more or less where the tongue was poking. And it took him a couple tries to get those legs moving. Cool. Um, later on, when you see Rick fighting a, a first rat, we see him in this getup right here. This is a bunch of little uh, nerves, nerve fibers, I guess, and cockroach legs there. He also has a whole factory set up that removes the rat's brain, skins its body, attaches the rat limbs and other parts to Rick's pickle body. Um, and the factory is all made from roach limbs. Rick controls the, the, the movements of the factory's pieces just by touching his tongue to blobs of roach brain just under his mouth. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that those are central complex, the central complex or central complexes from different roaches and connected to nerves that are running throughout his factory. 
the, the nervous systems of a few roaches ripped out and spread, okay, we're going to have to kind of agree to not worry about how he got them all out and all that. Anyway, but it's connected and stretched out to respond from, from the stimuli to the stimuli from those central complexes that Rick is poking with his tongue there. Um, that's not to say that you can make it for real, but it's, you can, you certainly can't make it for real and expect to keep your funding. Um, but in theory, yeah, it's, it's kind of possible. There are some problems. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but the roach legs would have their pre-programmed instructions thanks to the central compl complex. And again, in theory, multiple roach parts could be wired together kind of in series or in parallel, which is getting really nuts to think about. Uh, so that the stimulation flows from one set of nerves into the next set down with ganglia spread throughout. So to be fair, um, the trial and error that Rick would have needed as he figured out the mechanics, the levers, the push-pull combinations of roach legs, that would have made for some boring television. Um, and in reality, it would have taken far longer than the hour-long therapy appointment that Rick was trying to skip out on. So also the nerves would have had to have been tended to and hydrated and not overstretched and nourished and have their signals amplified to flow for distances that are much longer than a roach's body. Um, but making a factory where you've essentially rewired a bunch of organic robots, let's be fair, that's a, that's a fair enough thing to call roaches, um, that you rewire those into the tools that you need, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's blending that whole line of, of, of biological organism and machine in there. So thanks to, uh, let's pull it back to the real world here, thanks to Roach's simple nervous system and their um, uh, availability, cockroaches have been a model for research on kind of autonomous robot, robotic systems for years. The goal here is that someday, and probably sooner rather than later, researchers and engineers are going to be able to create autonomous robots that mimic insects in their motion and their control systems, or even weirder, uh, like you see here, you can outfit a cockroach with computer chips and other sensors that would allow you to control the roach's movement and figure out what's going on in the environment there. Um, to use a term that, that remote controlled cockroaches kind of makes people freak out a bit. So biobots is kind of becoming the, the in vogue way of, of saying these things. Um, and these things can actually be created by, by amateurs. Uh, again, more on that later, promise you, promise you it's coming up. So although it's an option to just go in and wire up that central complex, it's, um, it's too uh, complex. Um, a control module wired into the central complex would have to have a lot of electrodes and it could be jostled and, and moved around. You just don't want to overdo something or have to put a lot of electrodes in there because as they say in neuroscience labs where they do cockroach brain surgery, motrodes, mo problems. Anyone, anyone? Oh. Okay, moving, moving right along past that. Um, so there's the way around that problem with all those electrodes is, is a little bit more elegant. It's a, a kind of a high tech cowboy cockroach uh, setup here. So this is gonna oversimplify things a lot, but think about horses. If you want a horse to go to the right, you pull on the reins that's attached to the horse's bridle and the horse will go to the right. If you wanna to go to the left, it'll go to the left. That's basically what this setup is all about. Um, we don't have a tiny little cowboy riding up here, which would be awesome, but um, needlessly complicated. So this neural stimulation is made up of two parts. You got a chip-based backpack with a power source and some circuitry and two electrodes. One end of the electrodes is soldered right in here into that backpack. And the other is inserted into the stump of the cockroach's antenna. The antenna are clipped off and the electrodes inserted in there and secured with glue. So if the roach receives a stimulation through this electrode on this side, that will signal its central complex that something is on that right-hand side. So it needs to go to the left and vice versa for that side. A proof of concept experiment at North Carolina State University showed um, 
that a roach could be controlled wirelessly to walk on a pre-drawn serpentine path, which is pretty cool. Um, the method is so simple and it's set up in control. The researchers in North Carolina and North Carolina State said they could envision adding sensors to the roaches, allowing a number of them to move through an environment to collect data, um, look for sounds and smells, signals of life. Um, they can wedge themselves into these tiny areas that it takes a long time for humans to get into. Um, for example, uh, tied into local recent news, um, roach Biobots like this can be used uh, to look in collapsed buildings um, for, for survivors. One slight problem that you do have with this is that when you stimulate the nervous system, you can run into habituation. It's why we stop smelling new smells in a room after we've been there for a while or why we don't feel our clothes when we're wearing them like we do when we first put them on. Nerve cells reduce and stop their signaling to the same stimuli coming in over and over and over again. And that's a slight issue with with Rick's whole setup here, um, the nerves and ganglia that he's activating right here, it would probably habituate quickly uh, and just start ignoring the stimuli and just stop working. But they had that in the episode. One of the roach's legs that was supposed to do some sawing wasn't working correctly. So Rick quickly just yanked that off and put in a new roach leg so it would saw better. It's kind of like he knew about this or the writers knew about this idea of habituation and just put a little one-off in there that showed, yeah, we got this covered. Um, and it also suggested that R Rick had a stock of roach legs and roach ganglia around there to replace the pieces as, as they needed to be replaced. Okay, so anyway, I promised you that I would tell you how to do this yourself. There is a kit available. Um, that includes everything you need to create your own Robo Roach. That's that's what this company calls it, including a backpack uh, with a little wireless receiver that allows you to control your Roach from an app, literally from an app. Swipe to the right or to the left and the circuit board and the backpack stimulates the antenna via the appropriate electrode and um, appropriate cockroaches, the bigger the better. Those are available via animal supply houses, so you don't have to catch your own to experiment on, unless you, unless you want to. Uh, but anyway, the company that, that does this, this is called Backyard Brains. It's a company in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and you can get the entire kit, but be warned, the process is not really for the squeamish. Um, minor surgery on cockroaches is involved. You don't have to bite their exoskeleton from their brain and smash your tongue in there, but it does take some steady hands and probably a strong stomach. Um, so kind of wrapping this all up, while some researchers are looking at this control of the cockroach nervous system to create maybe swarms of biobots that can go in and, and, and look in areas for what's needed, um, world domination isn't the only goal here. Controlling cockroaches and using cockroaches, okay, that's a good thing, perhaps, but the idea that's really catching on is creating these small robots that use biomimicry, that we base off of what we see in cockroaches from their design and shape that can wedge themselves into these places um, to their behaviors uh, based on the central complex. So uh, the Army is using one. I believe this is the CRAM robot, C-R-A-M robot that uh, has been developed at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, these things, they say that they're getting to be where they're almost indestructible and can just move through any kind of any kind of situation where they need to go. So yeah, cockroaches may creep you out, um, may weird you out totally, but they save your life someday. So that's the road I went down on. Uh, just from seeing that episode, that little bit of an episode of, of Rick and Morty kind of got me thinking of just like, well, how does that, how would that work? And I chased it down and uh, things worked out pretty well, I guess, in that. Um, yeah. So I like to use these things to, to teach my students, to help my students. I, I use these things, as I said, to, to inspire to myself to write a little bit about them on the scienceof.org. And, and I hope that you give it a shot too. find something that interests you in, in, in science fiction. It could be, there's tons in Rick and Morty, but there's so much in any, anything else. Um, and there's a ton being talked about here today, but 
get into it. Find something that's kind of cool and lean into it. Learn what you can. I say in my introduction in, in the Rick and Morty book, and I swear by it, I believe that this idea of pop culture can light the fires for, for learning that other approaches just maybe can't. Um, and, and here's what I, I say I kind of end with in my introduction to, to that book, and I'll change it up for a little bit of what we talked about today. Um, as a science teacher, a writer, a communicator, whatever, whatever, it's my dream. You always hope for your students or, or your audience to, to do something with what you taught them. And it's my dream. Maybe, I don't know, 2044, at the Nobel Prize Award ceremony, the lead investigator of the team receiving the award for medicine is asked, what started their interest in, in, in neuroscience that led them to develop the cure for Parkinson's? And that's my dream to see this, that that winner would kind of look down get this weird little smile on their face and chuckle and go. Did you ever hear of a show called Rick and Morty? That was on back when I was a kid. And there was this episode where he turned himself into a pickle. And that's the inspiration. And that's what started it. And that's what gives us all kinds of cool stuff in the future. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your interest in science and critical thinking. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, of course, um, you talk about people being inspired by, uh, you know, science fiction and pop culture and whatever. Of course, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, innovators would point actually to Star Trek and things like that as inspiring them. I think so. I, I think that's uh, Star Trek. Unfortunately, as a, as a teacher, I find that using Star Trek references in my physics class or in my chemistry class, it, it basically makes me look like the mummy in front of them. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> as much as as those of us here may go, oh, Star Trek, it's it's an older and older reference. Um, but yeah, I, I fully agree. Actually, um, my wife and I, she's the other half of the science of, um, we're putting together panels for Fan Expo. Uh, these days. And we have um, panels coming up at Megacon in Dallas on the STEM legacy of Star Trek. It's uh, been 55 years since the original series came out. And I know that you can find maybe older, but then again, there was the next generation that helped inspire a whole lot of, of uh, engineers to, to do what they did for NASA. And then um, on top of that, the, the legacy of Star Trek, if you haven't seen the Nichelle Nichols documentary, Woman in Motion, I believe it's called, you, watch it. And I did not realize that she did so much with NASA and increasing diversity there. But yeah, it's the, the stories we tell. I like to say, and this is probably way too big for my britches, that, that, that fiction, and this certainly isn't, didn't originate with me, but fiction is the first draft of reality. We tell ourselves the stories and in science fiction, hopefully we tell ourselves the stories of the, the world that we want to be. Um, sometimes we tell ourselves stories of the world that we maybe on our bad days think we're headed towards, but, but yeah, we can, we can create the world that we want by just imagining it and telling ourselves stories about it. Uh, Marcus in the chat says, my brother is a science teacher whose interest came from the original Star Trek. So that's pretty cool. Yep. That is awesome. That is awesome. If anybody has a question for Matt about Rick and Morty, maybe about what else is in the book, go ahead and put it in the chat right now. Um, so what, what do we find on the science of? I know uh, the science of and uh, AIPT science run kind of parallel, but you guys, yep. you actually put up lesson plans and things too? We try to. That's what we try to do. It's been a little bit of a pause lately this last year. Both my wife and I are understandably full-time teachers. Yeah. So this last year was kind of took every minute of time that we had. Um, but yeah, it's, it's using, it's mostly using pop culture for it's, it's, it's stuff that I would talk to my students about or use with my students. A lot of articles on the site came from uh, discussions that I had with my students or grabs at pop culture that I would use with my students in the classroom. Um, and so kind of as we move forward, we're moving to bring it more to, to teachers um, or to, to really get teachers in, into the idea of using more and more pop culture um, for so, so many reasons. Uh, I think when we get most students back in the classroom, hopefully this year, um, 
we really need to kind of rethink a whole lot of things about getting and keeping getting and keeping science teachers and getting and keeping um, student interest and pop culture really, really helps to, to do that as, as you know, so. Yep, we wouldn't do it otherwise, right? Yeah. Um, so what you've got some you've got some other appearances coming up soon, right? Um, well, it's the yeah, at Megacon and with Fan Expo stuff, I've got those going on. Um, I think that'll take us up through we if, we'll see if we can get into Toronto, we're, we're scheduled to, to go, show up there. But yeah, we have uh, at Megacon in Orlando, about a month from now. Yeah, about a month from now, we have um, five panels scheduled. And uh, we're, we're populating those about we've got the stem legacy of Star Trek, we've got um, the last damn science, the last damn zombie science panel you ever need, which we're going to take, try to try to stop any zombie infestation with as much science as we can throw at it. Um, science of Suicide Squad, uh, probably just going to mostly focus on King Shark because he's pretty awesome. Um, what else? Oh, that's also Megacon weekend is the uh, weekend that Free Guy opens up. So we'll be talking about um, how do we get from Free Guy to Skynet uh, and the rise of AI. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting one. I know I'm forgetting one. And it's probably going to be like my favorite one that I'm forgetting. There's one more there. I think I did four. But yeah, so we'll be doing those at, at various panels around. And uh, yes, then my following that, my uh, appearances will be in my classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting the good fight on many different fronts. Thank you, Matt. Fighting the, the, the endless fight. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Matt. A lot of fun. Appreciate it. Thanks, glad to be here.